My name is Alec Goldsmith, the President of the International Blind Bowlers Association. We are making this video uh, in order to help the volunteer directors to better enable a blind or visually impaired bowler to bowl. Uh, we have assembled here uh, people who will help you in this task. We have on, the, on, on my right, Cathy Donaldson who in a few hours time will be the incoming president of the IBBA. We have Jeff Newcomb, who is one of the top uh, coaches for visually impaired and blind bowlers in the world. And Professor Gareth Slattery, who is an expert on site classification. All of these facets will make up what you need to know. Basically, uh, bowls for the blind, uh, the rules for bowls for the blind and the sighted are the same. We, we play to the same rules. There are, however, a few uh, additions which enable the blind or visually impaired person to better play the game. Uh, we have distance markers uh, every two meters Okay, these distance markers enable the bowler to gauge the strength with which he will deliver the bowl. Uh, they are numbered from 23, which is the minimum distance, up to 33. These are meters. Uh, in addition, we have a center string running down the middle of a rink, uh, which forms a 90 degree angle with the mat. And this enables the coach or the director to orientate the bowler uh, to the direction which he feels is the right direction. And uh, because of this constant angle, it's easier to get a, a constant uh, line or grass, as we call it. Uh, Jeff, would you like to amplify on these things? Coaching a blind player, um, you've got to set your player on top of the mat, facing in the direction to the other side of the green. You are only allowed five meters in front of that player. In international or any bowls, you're only allowed to be five paces, five meters in front of that player. You will work out the grass in the basic line towards the jack as in your trial ends and that will be the direction for your player to play by movement of showing them with a foot you're not allowed to use any other object except your foot or standing feet apart for the player to play between your feet once you've given them the distance whether it's from 23 to 33 they will play to that line of your foot to the other side of the green. Totally blind in the B1, play to sound, where your director always stands in front of them and either clapping their hands or talking so that the player can pick up their voice and try and play to that voice. Okay, thanks. Uh, just in addition to that, the, there's been a trend uh, recently which is very evident at uh, these games to coach uh, from the back uh, for a B1 player. Uh, when this happens you'll find that the B1 player normally has a swing, a swinging action so that the coach standing behind can actually see the direction that, that the bowler is going to, to deliver. Uh, also it's obviously very important for the B1 coach to orientate his, his bowler to, to the right direction. It's absolutely imperative that the coach must stand in a constant position because if he varies the distance that he stands away from the mat, each time uh, he will be giving his bowler a different line. So uh, this is normally done by pacing out a constant distance and then standing at a, in a position a certain uh, distance from the white string in the middle. Uh, another fact which we find constantly happening 
is that if the coach is standing in the wrong position and the bowler bowls and is very narrow or very wide, it is pointless the coach telling the player that you were narrow or you were wide. What it actually means is that the coach was standing in the wrong position and the coach must then adjust where he is standing. Blind or visibly impaired, it's not up to the blind person to try and correct his gloves. It's up to the coach to do that. It's also very important for the coach to make sure once he has orientated his player from the front is to retire behind the head and explain the running of his bowl towards the jack. He must not stand on the mat to, to speed up the game, they must retire and get behind the head. Right. Too, too, often, too often we find a person taking up the time, it actually shows disrespect from the coach to the player by leaving the player stranded on the mat and uh, in addition it doesn't allow the opponent to, to uh, set, set himself up on the, on the mat and get ready uh, and therefore causes the games to be a lot longer. So please vacate the mat as Jeff said, please vacate the mat as soon as your player is played. Stand next to them on the side and explain to them what is happening with their ball. Front coaching is an advantage for the B2 and the B3 players especially where they can see the line to the jack or they can pick up a foot of their director. If sighted bowlers can play to pegs on the side of the green why can't we give our B2 and B3 players the time to find a foot in front of them that can guide them to the white. Uh, I'd, I'd now like to ask Kathy, because for you prospective uh, directors out there, I think it's very important to understand what a blind bowler is looking for from the aspect of how you a, react and how you deal with, the, with, with, with your player. So Kathy, would you like to tell us basically what the, the director should be looking for? Well, the director firstly must uh, understand blind people and be orientated how to deal with blind people. That is very important and there are certain ways that uh, we train them how to handle blind bowlers. Firstly, um, they must not push the blind bowl in front of them and they must not feel that they uh, not a gentleman if they go uh, let the blind bowler go uh, not go ahead because we um, use their elbow to uh, find our way and that is how we train them so they can lead the blind bowler that is the B1 because we uh, are absolutely reliant on them to move around and um, they also have to orientate us on the bowling green they have to do much more as a, a, a director for a B1 person. Firstly, some of the other visually impaired people in other categories can go and find their own water, they can uh, find their bags, etc. And we have to train uh, the, the sighted director that they need to assist the blind bowler, the totally blind bowler, to, find, uh, to pre, uh, look after them and in a considerate and a patient way so they need quite a bit of patience to do this because um, for example they would have to go and fetch water for them they would have to find their bag for them and they would have to push their bowl closer to their foot and they would have to line up their bowler correctly on the mat or else that line bowler will not deliver a good bowl it is also very important for uh, a director who is coaching a B1 and a B1 to be compatible and to understand each other and a B1 blind bowler needs to know what is going on all the time. It is pointless as Jeff said just now, you leave him standing there and you watching the head and he doesn't know what's going on. We play bowls in the normal way as any sighted person plays it and 
if every bowl is explained to us, we remember it in our head and, and we form our own picture and therefore we can play the game and enjoy it. But if the sighted director just ignores the blind bowler, then um, it is pointless for that blind bowler to play bowls because they will not get uh, the pleasure out of playing bowls and they would feel that uh, they are undermined and that they're not intelligent enough. And I can assure you that the blind B1 blind bowlers are very intelligent and they are orientated well and they follow the game just like an ordinary sighted player and they could even tell you uh, when discussing the head with their director which hand to play. Um, another <clears throat> interesting point is if you um, are directing a totally blind B1 player that the bias of their bowl is marked so that it makes it easier for them to find their bowl and be more independent. Just on that subject, uh, I, uh, I think it's very important for B1 and B2 and B3 <laughs> coaches to understand that they have to check the bias of the, of the players' bowls because uh, if, if a, a blind or visually impaired bowler bowls a wrong bias, the person who's actually to blame for it is the director. Uh, one more thing I'd also like to add to what Cathy said uh, with, with a B1, it's, it's very important this idea of leading. Uh, each, each blind person uh, might hold on to an arm or a shoulder, but basically you have to go first when going down a step. You're the one who will start going down a step and the, pers the, the blind person will walk with you and be able to go in sync with you. Uh, too often we see people walking through a door and, uh, and the blind bowler walks into the wall next to them. So it's very important to understand this and if necessary to manipulate the bowler with your arms to, to manage to, to guide this way and make sure all the time that you are thinking because we don't want any surprises and we don't want anybody to get hurt. You have to think for the, for the bowler and, and make sure that they don't go into any obstacles. Similarly, when getting onto the bowling green, always the director goes onto the bowling green first and takes the, bow, the B1's hands to, to assist them onto the, onto the green. Explains that you're at the edge of the, uh, at the, edge of the green, this is where the bank is, and, and, and if there's that gap which they will know already, and you help them down onto the green. Uh, the other thing, uh, which is important is the independence of the bowlers. We, uh, uh, although people are, are, are might not have sight, uh, the bowler is expected to carry their bowls, to take them to the green, and at the end of the game to pack up their bowls, put them in the bag. So it's you know there's a you're there to aid the the, the blind bowler. Right, you are not there to, to actually spoon feed them to the, to the full extent. Okay, now I'd like to uh, get on to while we're discussing this, I'd, I'd like to ask you, Garrett, please to explain uh, the, the categories in full. Uh, Garrett was instrumental in a new uh, uh, revamping of the site classification which was just passed at our uh, general meeting uh, a week ago and uh, I'd like Garrett to explain it because there have been changes and uh, everybody should know exactly A, what the changes are and what these things mean. What is a B1? What is a B2? So Garrett, if you could please tell Thank us. As, as has been mentioned previously, the sport of blind bowls is not just for the totally blind, it also caters for the visually impaired or partially sighted. In order to make competition as fair as possible, players are categorised into one of four sight classes now referred to as B1 to B4. The B1 category is what normally, traditionally, we would regard as a totally blind person. While they may, some of them may have the perception they can tell the difference between light and dark, none of them will be able to recognize any hand movements in front of them. The B2 category is the first of the partially sighted categories, which goes from a player that can recognize hand movements up to an acuity or an eyesight level of 2 over 60. Basically what that means is that a person with an acuity of 2 over 60 
would be able to see something at two meters that a normal sighted person could see from 60 meters or in the view of an optometrist testing room to see the top letter on an eye chart a person with 2 over 60 acuity would have to be within 2 meters of the testing board to be able to see that. The B3 category then caters for people with slightly better sight and that goes up to an acuity of 6 over 60. What that means again basically is that a person with 6 over 60 would be able to see something at 6 meters that a normal sighted person could see from 60 meters or in the optometrist room sitting in the normal chair they would only be able to see the top letter on an eye chart. The new category that's been brought in is the B4 category and that deals with some people that have slightly better acuity but its main purpose is to deal with people with so-called restricted visual fields or commonly referred to as tunnel vision. You can imagine these people, if you close your finger into a ring and look through it, you can see quite well through that narrow channel, but you would have great difficulty moving around or finding your bowls. And provided the field is restricted to 20 degrees or less, then a person would qualify for playing in the B4 category. And in this way, by categorizing, we try and allow people to compete as much as possible against other players with similar visual disabilities. Okay, in order for the uh, blind or visually impaired bowler to know where his bowlers come to rest, we use what is called the clock system, which is an imaginary clock. And if you take the kitty as being at the center of this watch or clock, uh, you then describe the position of the bowl in relation to the jack by saying, for example, uh, your bowl is two meters at two o'clock. And on this basis, the bowler can know exactly where his bowl has, has come to rest. Uh, I think it's also important for people to understand that um, you are not doing a service to your bowler by not giving them an accurate description because the person is uh, trying to adjust according to the information that you give him and if you give him false information you'll find and maybe to make him feel better you'll find that in, in actual fact you're doing him a disservice because his ability to correct will not be based on fact but will be based on something which doesn't exist. Okay, so I think you should just mention the countries where we where Bowls for the Blind is played. Okay, um, <clears throat> the various countries where uh, Bowls for the Blind are played at the moment is Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Malaysia, Hong Kong, South Africa, um, England, Scotland, Wales, North Ireland, and uh, what's the 11th one? I forgot. Israel. Israel. <laughs> What you normally do is the player will now, the B2 player will now pick up my foot and by using my foot in a movement like that, he will play to the foot. Right, Gareth. Calling out the distance, calling out the distance to the player, 27 meters, he will deliver the ball towards my foot, 27 meters. Very important, once you have guided your player to the distance where he's got to play, you've got to walk back to him. You've got to walk back to the player and go and describe where the bowl has come to rest. You go back to the player and you tell him your last bowl has fallen a foot through at two o'clock. So now he is building up the picture in his mind to where his bowls come to rest. So he knows that he is a foot through at two, he might need a touch more grass to rectify his line to the white. It's very important to tell your player 
after each bowl that is delivered, where the bowls come to rest. If he's played his first bowl and the bowl has gone through two foot to two o'clock, tell him. If his second bowl has stopped a metre short at six, tell him, so that the player can build this up in his mind to whereabouts to the clock his bowls are lying. So that you, he can feel uh, exactly confident of playing the shots. If I have to tell him you're two foot short at seven o'clock and I want him to play on the backhand, he knows my bowl is lying at seven o'clock. I can play with a yard more running to try and push it up or to draw around it. But if there was a, a, a opponent's bowl lying at seven, half past six and eight o'clock, he'll be wary because he'll say, but those bowls, he's already built the picture. Those bowls are against me. Why are you putting me there? So he's already built that picture up. He knows exactly where his bowls are lying. And as a B2 player, just to confirm what, what has been said, when I stand on the mat, I don't see where the jack is or where any of the balls finish. So it's essential that the director gives me all of the information as Jeff has described. The only information I have is the picture that I've built up in my head, the distance of the jack, and then the line that the director will give me to play on. Very important when orientating your player is to make sure that when you give him the grass to the jack it's so important if you've given him you've undercut his line make sure that you go back to him and tell him it's not his uh, it's not for him to correct it it's for you to correct the grass so that he can play a better line to the jack I think the key thing that's being stressed here is the whole building up of the confidence of the player in the director. If the director is being honest and telling exactly where the balls are, if it's gone narrow and the director says that was my fault, I'll widen it, it allows the player to build that trust in the director, which is essential. Without that you can't play the shots with any confidence and they just won't come off. I think it's essential for a player and a coach to bond. Uh, you are his eyes through the tournament, you are his guide, you are his director or his coach, whatever you want to call it. But it's very, very important to build up that relationship so he can have the trust in every shot that he needs to play. That he has got somebody in front of him, the director, that will guide him through that. Sometimes she would step down, this is where they do, get in front of me, tell me, yes. Yeah, good, exactly. That's helping out to the green. This is what I do. What do you want me to jack first? Yes, just do whatever you do. We'll when help. I do the jack, I do this, right. and it's also my backhand. Right. Okay, we've got the we've got the jack set. We've got the jack set. Okay. 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 I think you should buy this set of bowls. Your foot behind the 12. Okay. This side, this. Okay. And we're going to walk and we're going to show you your bowl. Okay. We're going to show you where the bowl came from. Oh, what a oh, I'm happy about that. <laughs> Excellent bow. Excellent. It is.